Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another live webinar session hosted by EE Tech and All About Circuits. My name is Dale Wilson. I'm the Director of Engineering and Content for EE Tech and All About Circuits, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's session is brought to you by Efficient Power Conversion and is titled Unlocking Efficiency and Precision, Leveraging GAN FETs and ICs in 48 Volt Motor Drives. Let me tell you about our presenter. Federico Uña is a Senior Application Engineer at Efficient Power Conversion's Motor Drive Design Center. Before joining EPC, Federico worked as a test engineer on power test applications for automated test equipment company SPEA. He received a BS and an MS in electronic engineering from Politecnico di Torino. His master's research was focused on power electronics in collaboration with the Power Electronics Laboratory at the University of California at Irvine. Following the presentation, we will have a live Q&A session with Federico. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar using the Q&A section on the right-hand side of your screen. We will also provide our attendees a downloadable copy of the presentation near the end of today's session. This will be available in the Handouts tab. Thank you so much for joining us. And with that, I'll hand it off to Federico for today's presentation. Thank you, Dale, for the nice introduction. And welcome, everyone, to this webinar. Today, we'll be I will be talking uh, to you about uh, the use of uh, gallium nitride uh, devices in motor drive applications. What are the benefits that they can bring to, to motor drive inverters? And uh, how, what are the main, uh, the main uh, aspects to, to take into account when uh, using GAN uh, for designing uh, motor drive inverters? So, We'll see a, a little of a landscape uh, of all the of, of the motor drive uh, applications using GAN. We'll, we will see what are the technical advantages uh, of using GAN in motor drives. A couple of uh, very simple rules to, to design effectively a GAN inverter. And lastly, a couple of minor information about uh, the uh, the reference design boards that we designed and that, that you can buy off the shelf to speed up the no the, let's say the, the the knowing of gan in uh, in uh, in your applications so in this first slide we're seeing a kind of a i wouldn't say a graph but it's kind of a graph that identifies uh, um, some of the motor drive applications that can be divided into the dimensions of the motor and the, and the current that is delivered to the motor. So when we have a small current and the motor and the inverter needs to be a small dimension, well, that is the, the land of the power stage. Gallium nitride technology allows to, to realize uh, a completely monolithic integrated circuits that have digital inputs and power outputs without the need of an external gate drivers and has some uh, some additional logic inside, and that low low current small dimension is the the land of the monolithic power stages, while the small dimensions and the higher current is uh, the is the land of an inverter made by single uh, single uh, um, discrete uh, gen fets. So a, a typical example of this uh, is uh, is, a, is an e-bike. While I forgot to mention the, the typical application example of the power stage is uh, humanoid robots. So motors for, for joints, both the, the, the bigger joints in the, in the ankles, but also the smaller joints in the fingers, for example. And lastly, in uh, the higher current range where dimensions are not uh, so it's not so important to keep uh, very small dimensions. Uh, well, that is when you want to use uh, a parallel FETs. It's done also with silicon MOSFETs. It's possible to do it also with GAN FETs. There are advantages even, especially, I would say, at high current and high dimensions. And that this, this kind of inverters can be found in power tools, in drones, in, uh, in small electric vehicles, and, and also in, uh, in in the biggest motors of the humanoid robots. So let's keep this kind of um, representation of the motor drive applications landscape, uh, and let's bring it to the reference design boards that I have already mentioned. So we have developed uh, a certain amount of uh, reference design boards that can be 
that are meant for two purposes. Uh, the first one is, of course, to uh, to make it possible for customers to buy something off the shelf, receive it in a few days, and and test it immediately. So this is the first uh, the first purpose of uh, these boards. And the second one is, of course, to um, since the Gerber files can be found, to give uh, an example of how uh, a motor drive using uh, gallium nitride uh, devices should be made. So as in the previous graph, uh, we have uh, the boards made with uh, monolithic integrated circuits in the bottom left. Uh, in the bottom right, uh, we have uh, one of the, there are a, a couple of boards uh, which are uh, named here, EPC 9194 and 9193. This is the picture of just one of them. Uh, it's made with a single discrete FET, while in the top, there is uh, the currently only board uh, that has uh, parallel FETs uh, for motor drives. So let's go a little deeper into what are the advantages uh, of uh, GAN in brushless DC motor uh, applications, because uh, it's a common myth that uh, there is no, um, no benefit uh, in, in using GAN since uh, motor drives need to be driven with low switching frequency and with low transitions because of VMI issue. So we'll show that this is not the case. There are uh, positive effects on the overall system due, the, due to the increase of the PWM frequency. There are as effects due to the reduction of the dead time. And we will, uh, we will show also a little something of the, of the tests that we have done in, the, in our lab. So everything starts, all, all the future considerations start from the fact that uh, Gallium nitride devices switch faster and a little smoother than uh, silicon MOSFETs. Here in this graph, you can see the the difference between uh, the transition of uh, of a 80 volt rated uh, gallium nitride FET and uh, of uh, an equivalent 80 volt rated uh, silicon MOSFET. So thanks to the f faster transition, it's possible to reduce the reduce the dead time. And, it, and increase also the switching frequency because of the lower switching losses. So, as I have already mentioned, there are uh, two main uh, parameters on which uh, we can uh, work with. So, the increase of the switching frequency has two effects, one on the motor side and one on the inverter side. The one on the motor side is that a smoother um, current uh, that is uh, feeding the motor is uh, is making, is, is uh, has a lower harmonic content. So it's, let's say, a little more pure and makes the motor more efficient in terms of uh, electrical to mechanical power. And the effect of on the inverter instead is that uh, thanks to the much lower uh, ripple on the voltage, it's possible to reduce a lot the size uh, of the input filter. So reducing the, bio and the, the, the cost of the bill of materials and the dimensions of the inverter, which sometimes are important. At the same time, uh, it's possible also to reduce the dead time considerably. And this helps in uh, basically eliminating the sixth, uh, the, the sixth harmonic, and uh, so making um, again making a little closer to a sinusoidal excitation, the excitation, and so enhancing the torque per ampere ratio. Also, um, even though in the symbol of GANFETs you will see the more or less the same symbol of a MOSFET, uh, there is, because there is reverse con conduction, but there is not a physical diode. So the reverse recovery is zero. So let's go a little deeper into the PWM frequency increase. On the left, you can see uh, a graph showing the difference in having uh, uh, a 10 kilohertz ripple versus a 100 kilohertz ripple. So all the 
the ripple current. So if, if we see the a, a sinusoidal excitation that goes to a motor as a sum of the fundamental frequency and the, the ripple frequency. The ripple frequency is contributing to joule losses, to ohmic losses, but it's not contributing to developing torque. So reducing uh, the, the ripple current uh, in, uh, in the phase in, uh, in, in the phase excitation is, uh, is helping in uh, reducing this kind of contribution. While on the right side, it's possible to see uh, the associated power loss uh, in a motor due to the current ripple induced by the P PWM effect. So basically increasing the switching frequency from the typical application, so 20 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz, which is the, sorry, the 20 kilohertz is the, the typical switching frequency of uh, uh, a MOSFET, a silicon MOSFET inverter, while, while 100 kilohertz is, uh, is the, the frequency at which we recommend to, to operate uh, the, the gallium nitride inverters. There is roughly a, th um, a reduction by a factor of three in the switching loss in the motors. So, to further analyze these. Uh, this aspect uh, on uh, here you, you can see a similar comparison on on the left there are the waveforms so the current ripple close to the uh, to the zero crossing of the of the phase current and to the top so to, to the peak of the phase current uh, and we have uh, several amps of, of ripple uh, while on the right side uh, is the, the current waveform of the same motor which is run at 100 kilohertz, which is operated by an inverter run at 100 kilohertz. So in both cases, the, the, there is a 46 amp peak current, but in the case of the larger ripple, uh, we have, uh, so having the same peak current, the, the, the RMS value is a little lower. Or if you want to see it in another way, to have when you have the same RMS value, when you have a higher ripple, you have higher peaks, and when you have higher peaks uh, in uh, in the top left uh, graph, you can see that you are going the if you take the the graph of the satur saturation of the an inductor, which is the uh, the motor, you you go a little deeper into deep saturation or deeper in in roll off. So let's see how it's what we call a DC integrated motor is made. So typically the applications uh, that are um, that are made with uh, 100 volt devices, which is uh, the, the typical uh, breakdown voltage of uh, gallium nitride devices, are battery operated applications. So in when a frequency between 20 and 40 kilohertz uh, is uh, is used uh, and because of the fact that there are physically some cables between the battery and the inverter at, at least 10 20 centimeters long uh, um, some uh, some emi filters are uh, are necessary uh, in front of the inverter so inductors uh, choke common mode chokes or uh, or uh, big electrolytic capacitor so it's typical to, to, to use an EMI filter and, um, and that is, let's say, that has some limitation to, due to the switching frequency. So when the, sorry, uh, when the PWM frequency is increased, uh, these filters can be, according to the increase in the switching frequency reduced. So let's have a look about still still talking about the input uh, the input filter and have a look about uh, the the RMS current into into the input filter. So when when a low switching frequency and when I talk about low I talk about 20 25 30 30 kilohertz switching frequency is used then uh, 
it's almost compulsory to use electrolytic capacitors. And electrolytic capacitors are not dimensioned on their capacitance, but are dimensioned on uh, the, the RMS current that they can withstand. So it's hard to optimize these components when uh, uh, when you when you really cannot use anything else but them. And there are several rule of thumbs, and uh, one of them is to multiply 0 0.65 by the RMS current of the phase current, and then you can you get the RMS current through the the capacitors, and and then you you choose a certain uh, amount of uh, electrolytic capacitors that you need to reach that target current that you need. So this makes it even inevitable that in high current applications, the number of electrolytic capacitors must increase a lot. A lot. So on the other side, um, using uh, electrolytic capacitors, they, sorry, using uh, multi-layer ceramic capacitors, they are not dimensioned on uh, the, the switch, the, the, the RMS current that flows through them, but they are dimensioned on uh, the ripple voltage that can be admitted. So at lower switching frequency, it's impractical to use them because uh, it would be necessary to use too many of them. But when increasing from, let's say, 20 to 100 kilohertz, uh, then uh, the since the, the voltage ripple is inversely proportional uh, to the product of the switching frequency and the capacitance, then uh, if you increase the switching frequency by a factor of five, you can decrease also the capacitance by a factor of five. And at that point, the number of multi-layer ceramic capacitors that is necessary, it's small enough to, to make it possible to, to have a reasonably reasonable uh, bill of materials uh, and still a working inverter. And also, in addition to that, uh, the there is... Um, if you have a look at the graphs of the impedance of the capacitors, there is a, a sweet spot in the impedance of uh, the multi-layer ceramic capacitors close to more or less 100 kilohertz, which is one of the just one of the reasons why we recommend to run uh, to operate the motor drive inverters at this frequency. So let's have now a look about the reduction of the dead time. So the the reduction the the dead time reduction is directly linked to to how fast the the, the transistor can uh, can switch and the effect the effect of the dead time in uh, the motor drive sinusoidal applications can be seen uh, in uh, in, uh, in this picture. So when the dead time is very large uh, and this is a typical a typical number for uh, for MOS, for silicon MOSFET inverters 500 nanoseconds uh, there are discontinuities in uh, the modulation in the modulation uh, voltage and uh, these discontinuities which can be seen even if in uh, this graph i don't know if it's high quality enough i hope it is um, they kind of disappear while uh, the the time is reduced to an number which is uh, in this case it's 29 21 nanoseconds which is something that uh, gun gallium nitride inverter can easily handle. And so the if you if you do a spectrum analysis of these modulations, you will see that clearly uh, that this high that time is contributing to developing a, a sixth harmonic in uh, in the spectrum, which which can be measured let's say, in, uh, even with an oscilloscope, which is what we, we did. And it completely disappears when, uh, when it comes to, to a 21 nanosecond at time. And, and again, this, this, is, uh, this harmonic uh, contribution is not developing torque. So it's all energy that is wasted. And energy wasted means, of course, a reduction in the efficiency. So basically increasing the dead time also contributes to enhance the efficiency of the motor. So now the last slide about the dead time effect is that um, 
let's say we, we can uh, we, we can have an overall uh, an overall comparison of uh, the the two ways of driving an uh, a motor so the older way using uh, silicon mosfet devices with 20 kilos and 500 nanoseconds on the left and 100 kilos and 21 uh, nanoseconds that time on the right so the ripple so the, the scale of the the scale of the waveform is the same so you can see clearly that the ripple in the phase current is is, is larger in uh, in uh, in the case of the of the 20 kilohertz modulated inverter and this effect is also evident in the ripple current which is uh, reported in the red and uh, the volt the 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 voltage ripple instead as a, a ripple which is not so different so it's a different shape but the peak to peak value is uh, is not so different but what you should look at at this moment is uh, the number of components that are necessary and how big they are in the case of the 20 kilohertz modulated inverter and the 100 kilohertz modulated inverter so in the case of the 100 kilohertz modulated inverter just two small 44 micro sorry two 22 microfarad uh, capacitors are used multi less rank p capacitors while uh, in the case of the 20 kilohertz inverter not only larger through hole uh, electrolytic capacitors are necessary but also um uh, an in, a filter inductor was used was necessary to 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 have these this kind of smooth um, input voltage uh, waveform okay so let's have a look at some applications and in particular at the numbers that uh, that came out from uh, from some tests that were made so we are uh, now referring to the same uh, driving differences that i have mentioned before so we have uh, a mosfet inverter driven at 20 kilohertz and 500 nanoseconds at times running a, mo a certain motor in some conditions so 400 rpm and 5 amps rms in phase current this was made by the way with uh, monolithic integrated circuits and uh, on the other side, we have measured the same, in the same conditions, a gallium nitride inverter operated 100 kilohertz with 21 nanoseconds at a time. So we have already talked about the differences in, uh, into the, in the input filter. So in, in one case, we have an inductor and some large electrolytic capacitors. In one case, we do not have an inductor and we have just small ceramic capacitors. So the, um, The, the goal of these measurements was to show that a certain motor, so measuring the, the, the output mechanical power delivered from the motor to, to the load, and measuring at the same time the, the input power required by the inverter, and showing that the, the, the overall efficiency of the system was higher in the case of the gallium nitride. So I just focus on the efficiency. Uh, so the, the the electrical power, if if you measure the electrical power that is flow into the the, mo the MOSFET inverter and output and out of the MOSFET inverter, so before the motor, and you do the same for the GAN, surprisingly the the, the silicon MOSFET inverter is a little more efficient, and this, that is actually not a problem because the efficiency of the inverters in general, both MOSFET inverters and the gallium nitride inverters, is very high. But what the the main difference in the is the in the efficiency of the motor. So, since the the sinusoidal excitation is uh, let's say purer in the case uh, of the gallium nitride inverter, then the motor is working in uh, in a better way. And so you can see that while the efficiency of the inverter is very similar, the efficiency of the motor in the case of the of uh, of the gallium nitride uh, inverter is uh, is much higher and so the the efficiency in the end of the overall systems of the overall system is uh, <coughs> 6.5 times percentage points higher in the case of the gallium nitride inverter so 
So another application, uh, uh, oh, uh, some, something that I forgot to mention, I do it now. This was made on the motor of uh, an electric bike. So later we have also focused on uh, other applications. One of them is uh, uh, agricultural drones. Agricultural drones are used, uh, are uh, heavy load drones that are used to spray fertilizers and seeds and stuff in, in the fields. And they need to 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 deliver to to to, to fly with the kind of high payloads with respect to the drones that the people are used more used to. So like cameras drones, which are very light. These are much larger drones. They can weigh up to tens of kilograms, which is also tens of pounds, I think. <laughs> and um, so. The test that we we have done in our lab, we 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 bought off the shelf a, a, a complete propulsion system. A propulsion system is a system uh, made of uh, the which is which in in a drone can be directly connected to the batteries. So it's made of the, an inverter on the motor and of the propellers. So we have measured since the in in these applications the the torque load. Is given by the shape of the propeller, so the relation between the output power the output power is directly um, related to the speed of the motor, since also the torque increases with the speed univocally. So we have done tests by running the original MOSFET inverter of um, of these propulsion systems, and then we have uh, characterized it to to discover what was the modulation frequency and the, mod the other modulation characteristics of uh, the MOSFET inverter. And then we have run it with our uh, gallium nitride inverter with, uh, with uh, let's say, the, the tips that should be used when uh, using a, a gallium nitride inverter. And we have measured the, the input power required to, to run the motor at increasing speed. And then we have made the difference. So we have observed that it was required more power, more electrical power to deliver the same mechanical power to the propeller in the case of the MOSFET inverter with respect to the gallium nitride inverters. So uh, the, and the difference in terms of input power required to, to run the motor is reported on the graph that you can see on the top right. So on, on the x-axis, it's reported the, the motor speed, while on the y-axis, it's reported the, the extra power which is required by the MOSFET inverter. Just to give you a couple of numbers, in the highest part of the graph, so in above 2000 RPM, the the order of magnitude of the power delivered to the motor is uh, two to three kilowatts. So we're talking about uh, 500, uh, um, 500 uh, watts power reduction in a range of power, which, which is around two, two, 2.5 kilowatts. So it's close to a 20% 20, 20 uh, uh, efficiency increase uh, in the case uh, of uh, the gallium nitride inverter. So this, this uh, efficiency improvement is given by two factors. The first factor is given to the fact that uh, uh, the gallium nitride inverter used uh, sinusoidal excitation, while uh, the MOSFET inverter used uh, trapezoidal excitation. So six a block commutation excitation. And this is not only related to the gallium nitride technology is related to the modulation. But what is uh, the, 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 peculiarity, the peculiarity of uh, the gallium nitride inverter is that block commutation, trapezoidal control is used uh, in uh, inverters that suffer from very high switching losses because each one of the legs uh, is not switching during uh, a, a large amount of the overall electrical cycle. While this is not true in the sinusoidal modulation, because all the all the switches, all the transistors are always commutating during all the electrical cycle. So here, the key aspect about the gallium nitride technology is that since the, 
switching losses are very low, there's no problem in, in going sinusoidal even when uh, the current is very high. While that is sometimes a problem in MOSFET applications, and that is why some uh, in some applications, some manufacturers still use uh, block commutation. And while this was one just one of the two aspects. The other, the other aspect is, of course, the increase in the switching frequency, because in this case, we are comparing 15 kilohertz with 80 kilohertz excitation. We, have, we are not done with drones, because we have done, we, we have test, we have made the same tests on, on a different motor, which was instead modulated with a sinusoidal excitation. So in this case, it was a little harder to to, to show the effectiveness of, uh, of GAN. And so the, so in this case, uh, the, the main difference is that there is a mistake on this slide. I'm sorry about that. So on the left, bottom left, you can see the sinusoidal excitation of the MOSFET inverter, which is operated at 16 kilohertz. While on the right side, you can see, see the waveform of the gallium nitride inverter, which is not operated at 32 kilohertz, it's 120. I will correct the slides before, before spreading them. And, but still, even though they have the same kind of excitation, which is a sinusoidal excitation, doing the same kind of tests so having uh, measuring uh, the input dc power uh, at the same motor speed uh, there is still a benefit in using uh, a gallium nitride inverter in terms of efficiency of course and also these uh, these uh, if these um, e efficiency improvement uh, is is increasingly as you can see in the, in the top right graph uh, at higher speeds of course in uh, there is not only the in in the case of these applications maybe sometimes it, it depends on the on on the drones sometimes it's important to have the, to reduce the dimensions sometimes it's not so important but still for sure uh, a gallium nitride inverter Operated at the high switching frequency with respect to a MOSFET uh, uh, inverter is uh, is physically smaller, so you can save time, uh, you can save uh, volume, which means uh, saving uh, weight in the inverter and sometimes also cost because uh, if you have a, a smaller PCB, then uh, in the big numbers you you will also save uh, some uh, some some cost in the dimensions of the PCB. So there are some rules that should be that is convenient to to follow when designing uh, an inverter using gallium nitride fats. So <clears throat> the a common mistake might be to to consider uh, a gallium nitride uh, fat or uh, integrated circuit as kind of a very very nice MOSFET. Mm it's it's important not to do this uh, because they are uh, even though they they are both are field effect transistors they they are made in a different way so mosfet since mosfets are uh, vertical conduction devices they spread they dissipate heat uh, very well from uh, the bottom while in the case of gan fats which are lateral devices uh, they the um, the thermal resistance toward the PCB is not so bad, even though it's not as good as a MOSFET package. Uh, but the the thermal resistance on the top side of the device is excellent, which is why they are very good for uh, a top side cooling. So, in the case of motor motor drive inverters, as in the case of other applications, it's important to minimize the common source inductance. The common source inductance is uh, the inductance which is present between, uh, let's say, in the in the path of on on the source of the device in uh, in the loop of the gate driver, and it's the one which is more responsible for switching losses because it's slowing down the transitions and it's producing only switching losses. So, um, 
and this is something that is related to the layout but is then linked to to the electrical side then in the case of the let's say pure thermal side it's the the first layer the very first layers especially if the first three layers are the most important in, in terms of uh, of heat transfer to the pcb which is uh, why it's important to use uh, heavy let's say heavy copper layers so due to the pad limitations the the, the top layer cannot go much uh, beyond two ounces of copper so 70 microns but then the internal layers can be made with much heavier copper so four ounces in uh, in the first two inner layers is a very good uh, rule of thumb to 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 realize uh, efficient pcbs that are efficient from uh, um, a heat transfer set point then at the same time and this is valid also for for other kind of uh, of devices such as silicon mosfets uh, the in pad vias help a lot in uh, in uh, in bringing the heat down inside the pcb and spreading it through all all the layers of the pcb so it's very important to place the vias uh, to carry the current and to carry the the heat throughout all the layers of the pcb so thanks to the, the let's say the, the very good uh, switching performance of the transistors it's in in, in gallium nitride devices don't really need op, gallium nitride motor drives don't really need uh, decoupling capacitors such as other applications like DC to DC converters or uh, uh, silicon MOSFET made uh, gate drivers, as well as um, as soon as the a ground return plane is made inside the PCB. So when um, how to put this? So the electrolytic capacitors take care of reducing uh, of, of the effect at a uh, switching frequency level while the deep, usually the decoupling capacitors are meant for operating at the transition switching level so we, we are talking about tens of megahertz in, instead of uh, tens to a hundred of kilohertz so when interleaving properly uh, the, the the polygons in the layers between uh, the positive and negative uh, uh, dc bus uh, connectors connections uh, a distributed capacitance is spreading all around the pcb and so when uh, there is a, a very um, a, a return for the high frequency for the high frequency part of the switching current close to the gallium nitride FETs or integrated circuits, then this distributed capacitance can operate as a decoupling capacitor. And so there is no need to, to use them. And the transition are still very good with very low ringing, which does not cause EMI issues. So lastly, something that we recommend is uh, today's uh, um, PCB layout tools have, uh, besides the regular uh, license to, to design the PCB, have some add-ons uh, made by, by, by other companies sometimes that can be used to, to, to do finite element simulations to, to estimate the resistance of the, the traces and to um, and to have information about the current crowding in the PCB. So when before releasing a design, it's important. It's it's useful to analyze uh, these kind of aspects because uh, if you have a high uh, re resistance in the PCB that contributes to the heat and maybe it's also heating the device. So it's something that it it doesn't really matter about the efficiency of the inverter but it matters about the temperature uh, rise in uh, in the fats and in general in the inverter and also current crowding is also co contributing to developing uh, 
hotspots, which in the long run may, may lead to failures, which is something that usually people want to avoid. So we have already seen at the beginning a little of a landscape of the reference design boards. Um, they are all found on the PC website. There is a page dedicated to motor drive applications and you, you will see the gallium nitride, the, the EPC device, which is uh, related to that board. And you will also see the documentation uh, related to, to each one of the boards. So we have, um, uh, the EPC9176 board, which is made uh, with the uh, monolithic uh, integrated circuits named EPC23102. In the future, I'm telling you a secret, uh, there will be also a, a, a board which is very similar to this one, which is featuring uh, uh, the EPC2123104, uh, monolithic integrated circuits, which is... Uh, uh, which is still a monolithic integrated de device, but is a cheaper one because it's a little more resistive. And then we have the reference design boards with, that uh, are using uh, the discrete FETs. So in the center, you will see EPC9193 HC. It's available in two versions, both a version with a single FET, EPC2619, which is a very, very, very small FET. And it's also available in a, in a version with two parallel devices. So it's an example of a parallel device board. We have then, uh, and these these devices are QFN, are uh, chip scale package devices made uh, of uh, land grid riser bumps on the bottom side, which is which are meant for applications that require the inverters to be very small. While EPC9194 is made with a QFN device, it's able to deliver up to 35 amps RMS current in steady state condition and go to, to even higher um, short-term operations. And lastly, on the right, you, you can see the bigger one, the biggest one of the reference design boards, which is made by Four devices in parallel. They are still the EPC2302 devices. And this board is meant uh, to, to help designers in, uh, in designing applications that require higher current. And it can deliver up to 150 amps RMS. And um, yes, yeah, meant for, for applications such as power tools uh, or uh, Mini, mini electric vehicles and stuff like that. So in the future, there uh, in uh, we have just released uh, uh, a couple of new boards. So for those interested in uh, um, 150 and 200 volt rated devices, there will be there is a there are uh, new boards coming, featuring. Uh, EPC2305, both in the single version and in the parallel version, and uh, EPC2304, which is a 200 volt uh, rated device, is meant, to, meant for 150 volt battery applications. And the same as in the, in, in the previous case, there will be two different boards released in quarter three and quarter four of this year, one with a single device and one with the four devices in parallel. And then later in the future, uh, there will be also the, the boards that feature the EPC2361 EPC device, which is uh, the same QFN device that, uh, that you saw before in the boards that I showed you before, but this is less resistive with uh, its uh, big brother, uh, the 2302 because the 2302 had the typical resistance of 1.4 milliohms, while this is a 1.0 milliohm device. So you have may have noticed that all the power boards of EPC have the same connector for uh, the controller card. So we have made that on purpose. It's not a mistake. Uh, in this case, we have also um, we have made a, uh, a broad amount of uh, 
controller cards that have um, on uh, that, that are connected uh, to 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 demo boards provided by microcontroller manufacturers so it's possible to still use uh, the same tools of the controller manufacturers such as uh, ST microchip Texas instruments and Renesas and and plug them directly into any of the reference design boards so you can choose uh, whatever combination of microcontroller and reference design boards they will, all, will always become compatible and you you can still you can always use uh, the same tools that you used earlier since the programmers are uh, uh, the same that the manufacturers of the microcontroller provides so to summarize a little bit what we we have been talking about epc devices are in general smaller and um, have better switching performance with respect to traditional silicon MOSFETs, and this affects the efficiency of uh, the overall systems, the overall system or composed by the inverter of the motor. And um, I thank every one of you for your attention. If you are not only interested in uh, motor drive applications, that will be uh, that we there will be additional um, webinars on uh, on uh, gallium nitride fats for other applications that you are very welcome to to attend and they will be of course um, indicated on epc websites and again thank you for our attention and i think that now it's time for q a well great federico thank you for that presentation uh, one of the things i really found most interesting was your detailed discussion of using GAN in these BLDC designs and how it impacts that selection of electrolytic versus ceramic capacitors. That was, that was great. Um, we already have a lot of excellent questions from the audience. So I'll remind everyone that there's still time to submit your questions and we'll try to get to them. Uh, just type them into the Q&A section on your screen. So Federico, let's get started with the first question here. I think it's a really good one. Um, it is, since the GAN devices do not have a body diode, how do they behave when a motor is rotating by its own inertia and acting as a generator? Okay, thank you. Um, so they do not have body diodes, but they still have reverse conduction. So the, um, the pro of not having a body diode is that you don't have reverse recovery. The con is that the reverse conduction in the GAN is a, uh, has a higher voltage with respect to a diode. So uh, when a motor is rotating with its own inertia, it's still a, uh, and is acting as a generator, the uh, gallium nitride inverter is still working uh, as a, uh, still have reverse conduction to rectify. So it works the same as a MOSFET inverter, just a little more lossy. Okay, excellent. The next question is asking, are the, the current control FETs being used to create an AC signal from DC using PWM? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that's uh, how a uh, DC to the AC converter works. Very good. Um, this question is asking, is does switching at 100 kilohertz affect the microcontroller's CPU or the ADC requirements, meaning since the ADC will have a smaller window to sample the current. Well, actually, today's microcontrollers do not have limitations in uh, in uh, in going up to that to that sw switching frequency. So uh, the tools to generate the firmware are still a, a little old. So they may not allow you easily to go to 100 kilohertz, but the microcontroller can totally can totally. Uh, manage it and uh, and also yeah the, the adc has a, has a smaller window but depending that depends also on on sampling on on the current sensing method that you're using because if you're using like shunt measurements is a little more of a problem uh, if you're, you're using phase current uh, measurement it's little it's it's less a problem uh, but still anyways all the microcontrollers that we're using, and you saw the names of the biggest companies that money, uh, that provide microcontrollers, they all work. Excellent. 
All right, this question is asking about, in one of your examples, the dead time was 21 nanoseconds. And mm -hmm. he was commenting that you're, or they were commenting, your transistors have good on off times. Could you achieve 10 nanoseconds? So that's the first part of the question. Yes, so yeah, um, actually, um, the customers that design uh, uh, motor drives, even when they are using GAN, still want transitions to be not too steep. So in the case of DC to DC conversion, you can go down really to 10 nanoseconds, even probably five nanoseconds, something like that. In the case of motor drives, you still don't have very fast transitions because uh, transitions that are too fast generate EMI issues. So you still want to, to, to slow down a little uh, the, the transitions. And in that case, you cannot go to, let's say, 10, 5 nanoseconds at a time. 21 is a good number, 20, 30. But still, if you compare, if you take a, a silicon MOSFET inverter for the same applications, the dead time would be something like 100, 200 nanoseconds. So the, the reduction is still by a factor of 10. Excellent. And I think the, the second part of this question, I think you answered is why you don't reduce it. It's just because of that EMI and, and that kind of thing. Yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, now this question I think might have been, might be related a little bit to the first question, but it's how do you optimize the reverse current flow without, without an additional diode in parallel? So there are two ways. The first one is of course, to reduce the dead time. I, I didn't, um, it out clearly earlier but the because of the higher um, voltage drop on in the reverse conduction having a small dead time is helping in uh, in reducing the losses during to the due to the reverse conduction if in, you are doing uh, a if you need to rectify like if you have motor inertia uh, a waveform but this is true also for mosfets uh, the best thing is to turn the transistor on and make the current flow through the, the RDS on instead of the reverse conduction. So if you need to rectify, it's better to, to do it uh, synchronous in synchronously uh, by turning on the transistors instead of uh, making it uh, using them as diodes. Okay, and we're picking up a little bit of static from your your uh, talking. Maybe I'm not sure if moving is is causing that a little bit um, oh, th that we weren't getting in the presentation, so I'm not sure what that was. So, um, all right, this question is related to those the boards that you showed at kind of the beginning and the end. I would imagine do these have any of these have an EtherCAT slave on the boards? No, I'm sorry, they don't have it. Okay. Um, this question, what are the capacitors and resistors that you use for snubbers and what is their size? We don't use snubbers because the, the, if you do a good layout, you don't, you don't really use snubbers. So the, the transition is the, the switching waveforms are already clean enough not to use snubbers. And I would imagine you probably have um, design layout information out there on your website for people to see what a, what a good layout looks like, right? Yes, yes, especially on our book. We are about to release the fourth edition of, uh, of uh, EPC book, mm -hmm. which is all made by my colleagues and uh, myself. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's full of uh, information about how, how also how to do the layout, yes. Thanks. Great. So go check that resource out or reach out to EPC if you if you want to find that. Um, this question is asking, what sensor are you using for sensing the high frequency currents? Can you provide some names? Yes, it's it's all public information on the below materials of the boards. So uh, we we both use um, um, phase current measurement using shunt resistors and uh, instrumentation amplifiers. Uh, like the Texas Instruments uh, INA 241 and also some integrated sensors like the ones provided by Allegro and MPS. Okay, excellent. Um, how do you optimize the motor for a GAN application? Mm, that's kind of a weird question. No, <laughs> it's not weird. I mean, the let's say that the it's it's not always true that in, 
the the increases in the switching frequency is bringing benefit to to the to the efficiency of the overall systems because some motors have already reached the the optimum fre switching frequency at 20 kilohertz so it's more evident in uh, motors that have uh, smaller electrical constants so motors that have low induct low inductance motors benefit more uh, about uh, the, the characteristics of uh, gallium nitride uh, inverters. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's, it's selecting the right mode or the right application for, for applying GAN where it really is going to benefit. So, yeah. all right. Um, still working through a lot, of, a lot of great questions. The audience, we appreciate your participation today. It's been fantastic. So this one is asking, um, do you have... Uh, any recommendations on the current sensors at 100 kilohertz? I think you kind of already answered that maybe, but. Yes, so I would say very small ones, there is uh, both Allegro and MPS, uh, bigger ones, it's Allegro. Okay. Uh, oh, interesting question here. Do you have a, a book or resource you recommend for motor controller design in general? Well, we don't have a one uh, specific for motor controller design because we, we have, the question is actually smart because we have some books dedicated to DC to DC design. Mm -hmm. So we don't have yet a motor specific for motor control design, but we talk about uh, uh, motor control design both in the GAN transistors for uh, for for uh, for power electronics applications and uh, uh, GAN transistors in general. So we have two books, okay. and uh, they are both uh, found on EPC website. Excellent. Um, this one is, is the gain of the MOSFET FET sine wave versus the gallium nitride sine wave for a UAV application 30 watts at a three kilowatt power level? I don't remember, I don't remember exactly the numbers. Uh, yeah. So the gain was, yes, about 30 watts, but the, the, the power level was not three kilowatts watts, was mu much less because there were uh, two different motors. So mm -hmm. that uh, that motor uh, at the same speed had uh, uh, a much lower, uh, um, much lower uh, input DC power. So in the case of the high frequency versus low frequency, most um, sinusoidal application, sinusoidal excitation, the efficiency gain is uh, closer to 5%. Okay. Um, here's a flip question. What are the disadvantages of using GAN? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. No. So, uh, it's, uh, well, of course, some designers are a little more, let's say, conservative. So, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not something which is bad. It's normal that you're used to use something and you don't want to use uh, the new things. So. There, the I would say that the main disadvantage is that it's it's uh, more challenging to to start design with uh, with new technology and uh, because you have to learn new stuff and do things a little more differently from the previous case. Hmm. Okay, uh, what is the cost benefit between silicon and gallium nitride? So that really depends on the silicon manuf manufacturer and on uh, the, the the RDSO. But often we have competitive prices. And I think I remember when I was talking to you folks at EPC at the PCM conference last month that, that one of the things that was mentioned to me is that the GAN solution, the other components are often a lot cheaper and then the lifetime can be better because they're running at lower temperatures, they're not heating up as much. And so the, the whole lifetime issue of the cost is really important to think about and, and the total bill of materials. Yes. So yes, it, it would be important to have a look at these, uh, at the system level below materials, not only to focus on the price of the FETs because since it's a new technology, um, all the design is made a little different. And so other components often change. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Uh, looks like we got, we got one more here. Um, 
from the audience that'll well we're gonna, we actually got more coming in i can't we can't we're we'll run up the top of the hour so let's pick one more uh um how about this one here so um is any analysis on the EMC impact of different slew rates in motor drive systems? Do you see benefits from reverse recovery ring removal in the EMC performance, or is it pr primarily slew rate determined? So we we have just started uh, performing some uh, EMC performance uh, um, comparison between uh, all the solutions, and uh, so. I would say that um, as a first analysis, uh, the the main benefits, all, mainly the benefits, come from how uh, how good you do the layout. Not only the uh, the these benefits are not only really related to the device. So the 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 effect of the fact that you don't have a recovery ringing. Might easily be hidden below a bad layout, so that is the. I, I'm not sure if I answered, but it's something that is very tricky to answer. And gotcha. to the bank in general. And then back to your presentation, you know, yeah, it's a slew rate, but then how much ringing are you having, and how many harmonics are you? you know, all those things are driving that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to let everyone know that a PDF copy of this great presentation from Efficient Power Conversion is now available for download in that handout section in the upper right-hand corner. There's a couple other resources they've made available, so check those out. Federico, thank you for your presentation and that great discussion during the Q&A. Thank you for the time and for the show. Yeah, and thanks to the audience again for your, your great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. You know, you can reach out to EPC and, and get other answers. In just a moment, you'll be redirected to Efficient Power Conversions page on All About Circuits. You'll be able to view this session on demand by using the same link you used to view the webinar. Thank you all for your time, and we look forward to seeing you at another live session again sometime soon.